Now, Philip and Sebastian on uh, monitoring uh, Winty, uh, and you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our talk about how to eavesdrop on Winty in a live environment using virtual machine introspection. I am Sebastian Eidam. Next to me is Philip Bartle. And we will start with uh, looking on at our motivation and our goals for this project. So um, we at Cybos Technology um, developed uh, a malware analysis tool called Tyco, and we wanted to see whether this tool is really capable of analyzing real-world uh, malware. So as an example, we chose Vinti because it has been around for a long time, so it is, um, it is uh, well researched and it is really successful when it comes to attacking big, comp uh, big corporations. And so the goals for this project were to detect an infection with Vinti. We wanted to eavesdrop on the malware and remaining completely stealth while doing that. And for that, we wrote the Vinti Detective. So today, I will start off with introducing ourselves and Cyborgs. Then I will talk about virtual machine introspection. And after that, Philip will talk about Vinti and the Vinti Detective. Okay, okay. at first about Cyborgs. So Cyborgs is a small and rather young company. It was founded in 2017 and has about 25 employees now. And Cybos is specialized in virtualization technology and secure workstations. And just as a side note, maybe if you heard about Cybos before, we were involved in the discovery of the Meltdown and Spectre CPU vulnerabilities. So if you heard about us, um, it was most likely in connection with those two vulnerabilities. Okay, Philip is a student employee at Cyberus. Um, he studies cybercrime and cybersecurity with a focus on, on malware, and he worked on, on Vinti analysis and on this pro project for six months. Um, I finished studying um, computer science about two months ago, and I was um, specialized on operating systems and virtualization technology, and after studying, I joined Cyberus full-time. And the other two guys that worked on this project were Sebastian Manz. He also studies cybercrime and cybersecurity and Werner Haas. He's one of the founders of Cyberus Technology and he guided us in, in, in building the Vinti Detective and in, in this whole project. So let's talk about virtual machine introspection. Um, a virtual machine introspection system is a category of intrusion detection system. That means the they, systems collect sensor information from different sources, and they use those information to detect malware signatures or identify abnormal behavior. Mm, there are two main categories of um, intrusion detection systems. The host-based IDS, um, is a system where the intrusion detection mechanism resides on the same system they are designed to protect. This means they have a high visibility, so they can monitor events on the system and they can, so they can look into the system very well, but they have a low resistance because malware or attackers can corrupt the intrusion detection mechanism, um, which renders the mechanism useless. And a network-based intrusion detection system um, pulls this intrusion detection mechanism out of the, of the victim PC, and this increases uh, the um, resistance but lowers the visibility. And with um, virtual machine introspection, you can get the best of both worlds. So you have the visibility of a host-based IDS and the resistance of a network-based IDS. And now I will show you how this works. So this is how your system looks normally. You have your hardware, so your laptop or something, and on this runs your operating system. So you have an operating system kernel and some user applications that run in user space. And virtualization adds a layer between, uh, between your hardware and your virtual or your operating system, which then becomes a virtual machine. And in this virtualization layer, you find the hypervisor and a virtual machine monitor. 
Um, when you read about virtualization or when you hear about virtualization, you will often only hear, hear the hypervisor or the virtual machine monitor. But because of the architecture of our virtualization layer, we at CyberOS distinguish betwe between the hypervisor and the virtual machine monitor. So now we are in a spot between the hardware and the operating system, and this is a really powerful spot because on the one hand, we can control and inspect the hardware. So on the left-hand side, you can see we can read arbitrary memory addresses, and we can also um, monitor events from the, from the virtual machine. For example, when the virtual machine does a system call, we can look into the CPU registers and read those values. Mm, but as you can see, so being able to read bits and bytes is, is nice, but it, doesn't, it isn't too helpful because you have to make sense of this information. And this delta between those bits and bytes that you can read and the information or the interpretation of those bits and bytes is a semantic gap. And to bridge this semantic gap, you have to give your virtualization layer some information about the virtual machine. So if we now tell the virtualization layer this is a Windows machine and we give them the data structures and offsets of some kernel structures or the information and the signatures of the system calls, the virtualization layer can interpret those information. And now we can see, okay, this is an e-process data structure and this is an anti-create process system call. So here you can see we have the visibility of a host-based intrusion detection system because we can basically see everything, but we pulled the intrusion detection mechanism out of the virtual machine. So we increased the resistance and now we have the resistance of a network-based intrusion detection system. And Tyco can do all that. So this is a setup of, uh, so this is a normal Tyco setup. So on the left-hand side, you can see um, a small computer. This is a victim PC. On this PC, we, we boot um, our virtualization stack, and on top of that, an, an, affected, an infected Windows. And this PC is connected to the analyst PC via serial. In this case, it's serial over LAN. And then the analyst can use a Python, a Python API to um, connect to Tyco and to program Tyco and send commands to Tyco. And yeah, so um, some of those um, um, commands for Tyco um, are, for example, we can attach to a process. So here we tell Tyco to attach to a calc.exe process. And then when, when Tyco finds this process or Tyco waits until this process starts, and now we get an object, and with this object, we can do all sorts of things. Um, for example, we can manu manipulate this process, so we can stop processes, we can resume them later, and we can inspect those processes. For example, we can read the linear, or the, the memory in this process. And another thing that Tyco can do, as I said, we can so we can use system call breakpoints. So for example, we can tell Tyco to stop a process when it does, for example, an anti-create process or an anti-create file system call. And then Tyco can interpret those system calls for us. So we can see the addresses of the buffers the, the system call uses and stuff like that. So um, yeah, Tyco, as you can see, is a really powerful um, tool. And now Philip will tell you something about Vinti and how we use Tyco to, to eavesdrop on Vinti. Yes, right. So first, we are going to talk a little bit about what Vinti and the threat actors behind that group actually is. They're presumably a state-sponsored uh, Chinese threat actor, as I said, and they have been deploying their remote access tool, also called Vinti. According to Asset Security, they have been around since um, at least 2012, and they are still going strong today, deploying newer generations of this remote access Trojan by now, obviously. If you um, take a look at the path of the malware and uh, which companies have been targeted, you can see that there are um, some very big companies in there Siemens and ThyssenKrupp, Bayer, BASF, for example, 
And um, uh, I found a very nice quote from a German public television um, article where they, they interviewed an IT security expert who said any DEX corporation that hasn't been attacked by Winti must have done something wrong. So you can see they, they really um, focused on espionage in this case. But that's enough for Winti in general. Let's talk about how it works so that you can later understand the approach that we took. In this picture, you can see in the top left, um, that's the attacker, the command and control server, which is communicating to the um, infected host machine, ov obviously over the internet. Down here, we have a very simplified look at a fully deployed Winti on the machine. Um, S is the infected host. Winti consists in two components on the machine, a driver and a worker component communicating over um, or via that a, um, a memory region here. The sole purpose of the driver component is to establish communication with the command and control server. It does that by intercepting incoming TCP traffic and looking for a, a Winti specific magic string in the header and once it finds this, it will place the incoming and encrypted package into the memory for the worker to find. It also posts this memory region for answers that the worker has come up with to send back to the command and control server. The more interesting part for us is the worker, though. During, infect during infection, the worker has its code injected into a server host exit, um, which will be very interesting for us later on. The worker is always pulling this region to look for new orders from the attacker to process. It does that by pulling the region, reading what is inside, decrypting the message, processing the order, coming up with an answer for that, and it then writes the re-encrypted answer back into memory for it to be sent out. What's really interesting for us here are those two arrows, because what they actually mean is the system calls that the worker uses in this case. And as we have said before, we can interpret these system calls. And that is um, what we did later on. But first, as I said, everything we're reading here we could read here is always encrypted as the worker does the decryption and the encryption of new packages. So we are going to take a look at the encryption that Winti uses. Let's say you have an unencrypted message. <clears throat> In order to decrypt it, Winti would generate a four byte random key and just XOR it blockwise over the message and send it out. Decryption obviously is a little bit harder because the receiving communication partner could not possibly know the random key that has been generated before. Therefore, which uses a static key as a specific offset. Both communication partners obviously know where the static key is and what it is. Therefore, by knowing that, the receiving communication partner can XOR um, the static key over the offset to calculate the random key and use the random key to decrypt the message. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the detective. The detective consists of three phases, a detector phase, detector phase, and the decryptor. What the detector does is it's, it uh, looks for the infected service host process. The detective then has to differentiate between the actual uh, service host functionality and the malicious Winti usage, extract the data from the system calls, and then the decryptor decrypts it. A closer look at the um, detector shows that <clears throat> we first get a list of all process IDs of the service hosts that are running on the machine, and then we are going through these one by one. We pause. The first one in our list dump its memory via serial onto our analyst PC, use the Java rule that we have written um, to detect an infection, and therefore determine if, the, if this process is in fact infected or not. 
If that's not the case, we would cycle back, go to the next um, process ID in our list of service hosts, or maybe just abort if there is no infection that can be found. If we have found the infected process ID, this process ID is then given to the def detective. The detective, as I said, <clears throat> then has to differentiate between all the noise that the service host is uh, creating by its genuine functionality, what Windows intends it to do, and the malicious Winty usage. As I said, we know that Winty, the worker, reads and writes data to this memory region via system calls. It does that using anti-device IO control file. That's the name of it. And this system call can do various amounts of things for Windows, and that's why Windows uses IO control codes to further define what, it's supposed, what the system call is supposed to do. And Winti actually brings its own IOCTL codes for um, the read and write <coughs> action in this case, meaning whenever the worker would read something, um, we can detect this IOCTL code from the system call that we have intercepted and interpreted, and then we could look into the out buffer, uh, the output buffer of the system call, because it, since it's um, trying to read it, that is the um, out buffer, where the data would be found, and for writing, it's the input buffer. But as I said, we're also only reading encrypted communication data here. Therefore, we would have to decrypt it first uh, for us to actually make sense of the data that we're seeing. But as I said, encryption in Winti is really easy, so we're not going to dive deeper into that. We are going to take a look at how we proved our concept. Does the detective actually work? For that, we used a ThyssenKrupp script that's an Nmap scripting engine script which basically does the handshake with the malware. It's, it simulates being a command and control server, sends a hello and a get query host information package, and the malware would answer uh, supplying information about the host name and the Winti specific ID that, is, that this ma uh, malware sample has. <clears throat> we used this Nmap script to, um, to gather these two packages for the handshake, and then we replayed, attacked it to the malware um, because we have to trigger the worker into actually reading and writing data, into thinking that it's communicating to a command and control server because otherwise we are not seeing these um, system calls even being generated. And at the end, we used Wireshark on our analyst PC to see, uh, to look at the TCP data that's coming in to see if we can find uh, the, get, the Winti's answer to the get query host information package. And as you can see here, on the top side, you're seeing um, the Wireshark uh, recording, and down below, a screenshot of what we have extracted from the system call. These bits and bytes that you see up here are obviously encrypted, but it's the same that we have extracted from within the input buffer of this right system call. Um, and if we decrypt it, it would say nuke PC, which was the host name of our little Intel NUC that we used to infect there. And the next part of it is the Winti ID, and then together with some more stuff about the host machine. Now, one might ask, what's the difference between our approach and that Nmap script? Because obviously, the Nmap script can also decrypt messages and say the machine is infected or not. The main difference is that we do this without being detected. Whenever the Nmap script would connect to the machine, 
it would always reset any current connection that there is, if there is any. On our case, that is, uh, in our case, that's not possible because we're not sending actual um, packages to the malware. Only for this demonstrator we did, but in the wild, in a live scenario, we would not. Also, if the communication protocol of the malware would change for further generations of it, the Nmap script had, would have to be adapted um, a lot for that to still work, to still show an infection, whereas ours would still be, uh, our, our uh, solution would still be able to show the communication data that's going in and out from the worker. And obviously we can see a lot more than just these two hello and get curry host information packages. We could see every communication the attacker would have with the malware. <clears throat> so now, Let's take a look at a little demonstration of it. On the right-hand side, you can see um, the Nmap script, just for comparison. We infected the machine using a um, live sample. It's, it uh, doesn't follow the no usual infection chain. We installed this using RunDLL32 but um, as you can see, it did end up in a um, genuine infection of the malware because the Nmap script also has found it. <clears throat> and down here, you can see a split of the um, string that I've just showed you. On the left side um, will be the output from our Winti detective. We are supplying the, um, the IP address as well here because as I said, for the demonstrator, we had to um, send these replay attack packages just to trigger the worker into action. This would obviously not be needed in a real life scenario. So when we run it here, we can see the um, detector starting to dump virtual address space. Process ID 900 is a service host. And for this first process, it could not find any infection. So it goes to the next one. <clears throat> this took um, seven minutes here in this case. That is because we have to get all the data from our infected machine via serial onto our analyst PC to use the Yara rule here. We are developing a solution where you could supply the Yara rule to your virtual machine introspector. Um, to, does, to do all that um, over there because that would be way faster, but as I said, it's still in development. And this is all, uh, also ultimately the reason why, why we have decided against the live demonstration and for a video because the live demonstration gremlin would surely place the infected service host at the very end of the list and that could take up to 30 minutes just to detect the infection. So let's resume here and see what it's about to do. It will detect the infection in this process, in, in this case. And then you can, will be able to see that the command and control script, our C2 script, is going to start here in just a second, and it's sending packages. <clears throat> and we can also see that uh, there are already system calls being intercepted. These are um, the worker reading right now, meaning it's traffic coming from the driver to the worker. And down below, you can see the encrypted data that the worker has read here. For the demonstrator, we only showed um, encrypted data, and we also only showed it whenever it's, um, a, a piece of data was discovered first because it would just say the same stuff down here, yet again. This demonstrator, is, because it's not communicating with a real command and control server, it's not reading any human readable data, because the hello and the get curry host information package aren't human readable. That's why we didn't decrypt it. But we did decrypt the writing, 
because the uh, malware is about to send these, this information here. What we can see here is the encrypted answer to the hello. This is what we would be able to see if we de decrypted the stuff up here. But um, the most important line is this one. This is the answer to the get query host information package. This is where we can see um, that string that um, the Twist Encrypt script has also seen. <clears throat> this is the answer of the malware as we can see it from within the system call. And we're also able to decrypt it, meaning at this point, we showed that we can, in a live environment, eavesdrop on the malware without it having any chance to know that, it, that it's being spied on. The attacker would never know because we are just below the operating system. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, as I said, just as a quick summary, we used virtual machine introspection to show what is possible. We took a very well-known malware because it would be, would be well-studied and that's idea for our uh, use case here. And then we leveraged everything that Tyco offers to, um, to show how you can listen in on what the malware is doing at any given time, basically. So that would be it from our side here. Thank you. That was fast. <laughs> Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, here. Oh, much more. Thanks for the talk. Um, first, I have two questions. <laughs> uh, how many environments do you support? Because uh, it's not the same Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10 by the kernel or change into the structure by the semantic gap that you, you told. Maybe that's um, one for you. So, so the question is uh, how many operating systems we... Yes, currently, I mean... Uh, yeah, so um, at the moment only... So at, at first, um, Tyco is at the moment not active, as a, so we don't develop it at the moment. Ah. Um, but um, when, we, um, when we worked on this project, so as you said, um, the, the offsets and uh, for the data structures change with nearly every Windows um, version. So um, for every new Windows version, you have to create those offsets and stuff like that. But I think it was at the moment like 30 Windows 7 versions, but no Windows 10 versions. Okay, and the, the other question is that I think that was very interesting, the example. Uh, uh, in that moment, you are hooking, uh, I mean, in some way, no? In real time, the Winti, no? And yeah. And maybe doing an, a snapshot, okay. for example, from the memory and running recall or volatility, uh, because at the end you are uh, checking the the CP host, no? So have the same results or or not? I'm not quite sure if I understand your question correctly. Um, no, because you are dumping the the process, no? You are yes. freezing the the virtual machine or the the sandbox, and you are dumping the, all the process, the memory regions, and you are running a Yara, no? Uh, yes. Looking yes. for Winti. Uh, right. And it's very, it's only uh, that maybe the same uh, task can you do with uh, dumping the memory directly from all the, the virtual machine and, run, and running volatility or, or recall that and traversing all the processes in this case and running the yard. I mean that is the same result, no? Yes, yes. So um, I actually also did that before um, where we used Tyco to um, do complete dumps of the machine and then you could uh, use volatility, as you said, for example, to analyze the machine as well. Yes, that would um, result in, in the same. Um, but in this case, we only needed the service hosts 
because we knew the, the Winti sample that we analyzed was always going to be in, uh, injected into a service host. So that was just faster as for us. As I said, there are limitations for the system right now, which can make it take some time. <clears throat> so that's why we didn't do a full dump of the system, but that's totally possible. Oh, okay, thanks. I think there's one next to you. Yeah, right. Hi. Um, Constantine here. I would be interested if you've been able to use Tyco in an incident case or like got data from an incident case and then test your um, tool if it worked with um, yeah, real data. So I'm, as far as I know, it has um, not yet been used in a real case scenario in a real incident. Um, but we did use real samples and everything where we uh, try it out. But as I said, I, th I don't think it was so far be used in a um, real case incident response scenario. Thank you, because it was really amazing to presentation and I was thinking it could speed up time for, for incident cases. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is about your introspection uh, technique. So it is true that your um, solution will allow not detecting uh, the mechanism itself that is used uh, to uh, kind of intercept uh, winning TI's traffic, but it seems to me that the more common problem by most commodity malware would be um, the detection of the malware of the environment in which it, it runs, um, in the sense that it would detect that it runs in a virtual machine and then would cease to run afterwards. My question is whether your uh, introspection technique uh, allows intercepting uh, instruction level um, evasions, for example, a CPU ID instruction or a read timestamp uh, counter instruction and instrumenting it so as to kind of hide the fact that uh, that image is running within a virtual machine. Yeah, um, Tyco was developed with um, stealth in mind. So, yeah, we can do, so um, at first when the operating system um, runs CPU ID, for example, to um, get the CPU, um, Tyco will just report the CPU. So um, Tyco reports at no point that there's a virtual machine running. So yeah, we had that in mind that uh, the, the operating system and malware cannot detect the virtual machine. That was the idea of Tyco. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I really like that sweet spot between the hypervisor and the OS and uh, knowing the fact that Windows kernel is less and less open for the hook in kernel level. Um, I think this is a great project and be, can be used for that. Uh, but what about the, the n not uh, vir no virtual machines, the, um, uh, the normal laptops and workstation? Are there any research to have this layer for this workstation and laptops as well to be able to use this tool for, uh, for secu security purposes? Um, so the reason why we don't um, actively develop Tyco at the moment is that just nobody wanted to buy it. And um, so at the moment, so the, yeah, the idea is right. So we could use Tyco and this technology to um, introspect running machines on laptops and, and computers and be able to detect infections. Um, so yeah, that would work. Um, but somebody has to pay for the, for the development of that. There are, <clears throat> as far as I know, there are a lot of thoughts around um, the same thing that you're um, talking about right now, but um, there's just no time for this right now in our hands. Um, also, seeing as the points that Sebastian has pointed out, so. Okay, another question. 
Vitaly. <laughs> uh, sorry, I just didn't dare to ask first. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, cool project. Well, I first questions like Tycho, is it? Available in some in some way to the community um, to try and play with this, or is it just your in-house project that you use internally only? Because I'm, I'm just not familiar with this. And maybe second question is: um, I noticed that you monitor the syscalls, cool. But can you somehow drill down to the user space and see which API caused that call in the kernel? <clears throat> so, as for your first question. Um, Damn, I was already thinking about the second one. <laughs> is, it, is it available in some form to the community? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, as far as I know, right now it's not open source because of the underlying virtualization platform, um, fortunately. Um, as for the second question, um, I think there are actually thoughts about um, doing this stack tracing, as you said, um, to to see where the system call is coming from. Yeah. Excuse me? Which virtualization machine? Which virtualization machine? What would On what virtualization machine? On our own virtualization that we developed for this. Um. So, um, as I said, we, we have a, or we distinguish between the hypervisor and the virtual machine monitor. And the hypervisor is a project from the university in Dresden. Um, so we took that and um, we, yeah, we, we did some modifications to it. And, but the virtual machine monitor and the introspection module was developed at Cyberus from scratch. Okay, a last question. One, two, three, okay, thank you very much.